Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Jason Mackey's First 10, a short version podcast talking all things Pittsburgh sports. And today is Tuesday, November 5th. It's election day, but we don't really talk about that here. We're going to talk about a lot of different sports. We're going to talk about pit basketball. That's actually where I was tonight. Uh, Steelers get back in action this week. Going to talk a little Steelers commanders, Jalen Daniels. Um, how about him, huh? Uh, really surprising, excellent uh, start for the young quarterback for Washington. Uh, Jared Triolo is a gold glove winner. How about that? And the Penguins have a little situation on their hands playing better. Sidney Crosby's come alive. Tristan Jari, what to do. Before we get in, into any of that, though, I want to remind you that we're sponsored by Edgar Snyder & Associates. If you're injured in an accident, you're probably wondering what's next. For over 40 years, Edgar Snyder & Associates has helped injury victims answer that question. Whether it's gathering evidence, collecting medical records, or dealing with insurance companies, Edgar Snyder & Associates has helped over 75,000 people handle What's next? Call 1-800-94-EDGAR or visit edgarsnyder.com for a free consultation. And remember, there's never a fee unless they get money for you. So our lead topic today is Pitt men's basketball. Now, they played Radford on Monday night at Peterson Event Center, and I can't say it was the most uh, entertaining back-and-forth game. It was hardly that. 96-56 was the final. But I wanted to get into a few impressions and what I saw out of the Panthers and what I think so far of Jeff Capel's team. And I know it's still extremely early. Um, and they've lost some stuff, obviously. Uh, Bub Carrington to the NBA, Blake Hinson to the NBA. Uh, but they have some guys back, too. Ishmael Leggett, uh, Jalen Lowe. They were the two standouts to me. Um, they combined for 40 points. And they filled it up across the board. Um, Ishmael Leggett was the sixth man of the year in the ACC last year and finished with 12 rebounds to go along with 19 points and did just a little bit of everything early in the first half, uh, making things happen off the fast break, getting things done around the rim. Jalen Lowe is an extremely fast, exciting player to watch. Uh, those two guys kind of drove the bus, but they weren't it. Um, one of the players I was most impressed with, honestly, was Cameron Corrin, uh, the big man transfer from Florida State. A lot of Pitt's offense early on flowed through him. I didn't quite expect that. Jeff Capel said after the game he does a lot of things that Pitt has been missing for quite some time. And, you know, I'm not presenting him as Aaron Gray or anything like that. He's not. Uh, but can he be a scoring threat? He finished with 12 points. I think he can. Um, all Pitt's starters, by the way, finished in double figures. They actually had six in double figures. So it was a lopsided outcome. You don't want to read too much into it. The competition is obviously going to increase, but, you know, talking to people about Pitt, hearing Jeff Capel talk, um, reading, studying more on this Panthers basketball team, this arguably could be the deepest roster that Jeff Capel has had. And uh, that's saying something. And, uh, you know, there's been a, 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 I've talked about it on this podcast, this sort of narrative around Pitt and they got screwed by the NCAA selection committee, right? Probably should have been in the tournament last year, made it to the semifinals of the ACC tournament. They went 22 and 11, finished fourth in the ACC, um, seventh in the preseason polls. That's the highest uh, any preseason team has been or predicted to finish, I should say, under Jeff Capel. Uh, and yeah, they're going to do it differently. One thing Capel talked about after this was shooting the three ball. Um, they're not going to have anybody like Jeff like uh, Blake Hinson, excuse me, uh, to knock down the majority of threes by himself. But they have a lot of different guys who can contribute in different ways. Uh, maybe that's Guillermo Diaz-Graham. Maybe that's Brandon Cummings. Obviously, I mentioned Lowe and Leggett. Uh, Zach Austin did some things. Damian Dunn, another transfer, um, was a two-time all-conference pick at Temple. They have some guys who can, can put it down. And, and they did that a little bit against Radford. Um, should be a very good shooting team. They outscored Radford in the paint, I believe, 50 to 16. That went a long way toward uh, controlling things. Capel wasn't thrilled with how they rebounded, but they defended well. Uh, they ran well in transition. You could see the offense kind of opening up after a first, kind of a slow, you know, seven or eight minutes. But um, this is a very offensively gifted um, and defensively conscious pit team. So I'll be curious to see where they go after the Radford game. Um, hit on Jared Triolo a little bit real quick as we transition to Pirates. Uh, congrats to him. Uh, just a quality dude, a quality defender. Obviously, he needs to produce more with the bat. He knows that. The Pirates know that. Not a big thing. But it's interesting to see him win a gold glove as a utility player. And Triolo, by the way, at third base had 60 starts. Second base, 42. Shortstop, eight. First base, four. In right field, played two innings. Made that tremendous catch, if you remember that. Made just three errors in over 1,000 innings. Um, two at third, one at second. Combined for six defensive runs saved, according to fan graphs. Um, again, we know that he can catch it. So 
You know what struck me about Triolo winning a gold glove? And I don't, I don't have any issue with it. Played 125 games, made 114 starts. Uh, again, very, very good defender. Are the Pirates suddenly going to not have Jared Triolo somewhere? Are you suddenly not going to play a guy who won a gold glove at a position, multiple positions, keep him on the roster or something? I mean, I'm much easier or much more okay with Jared Triolo as like the 26th man. Um, it doesn't change my thinking for what the Pirates need to do in first base specifically. They need to upgrade that spot. They need to prioritize offense. But, uh, you know, good for Jared Triolo. Deserves it. Um, an, another, you know, gold glove winner uh, following Key Brian Hayes, and they've had a couple more lately, but uh, certainly deserving. I'm just thinking about what it maybe means in a larger context. All right, want to get into some Steelers and Penguins talk on the other side of our break, but first, a 30-second message from the Bradenton Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. Embrace the laid-back charm of island life while sinking your toes in the sand and discovering real, authentic Florida in the Bradenton area. Unspoiled beauty and pristine beaches, a vibrant waterfront downtown energized by local arts and culture, fresh Floribian cuisine with a flourish of rich history, and friendly locals ready to welcome you to this preserved paradise on Florida's Gulf Coast. Plan your visit today at BradentonGulfIslands.com. And welcome back to First 10. I'm your host, Jason Mackey. We're here in the middle of the morning, Monday through Friday, around 10, 10 a.m., uh, talking about 10 minutes, all different things, Pittsburgh sports. And so Steelers, Commanders in D.C., um, actually Maryland, um, on Sunday at 1 o'clock. I'll talk sporadically throughout the week about this one. It's kind of cool for me personally. I think um, some of you guys and girls maybe know I lived in D.C. for about three and a half years out of college. Um, actually became a little bit of a Redskins fan. I interned in D.C. my senior year. In, that, in college um, at a TV station down there. I got some of my first experience going to Redskins Park. And at that time, um, that was um, Clinton Portis. Remember the year where he was dressing up in all these goofy costumes? I was around for that. Mark Brunel was the quarterback. Chris Cooley was the tight end. Um, Sean Taylor was there. It was a really interesting roster. And the, the Redskins at the time caught fire in the second half, went to the playoffs. It gave me a taste of what the commanders what the redskins what washington's football team means to that city and it's really cool i mean it's a it's a great football town they really get into it and you know what things are kind of turning that way right now with how the commanders are doing uh, i read a column in the washington post that i really like candace buckner um is a columnist there that she does a fantastic job but uh, basically saying that washington is now at the adults table and this is what it's like to not have a bunch of drama and all this stuff surrounding the football team and that's kind of been it because of Jaden Daniels, they're seven and two uh, right now, and, and the rookie has just been absolutely fantastic. Entering Sunday, they were averaging almost thirty points a game. That's third in the NFL total offense, almost four hundred yards per game. Also third in the NFL. They're running it extremely well. Uh, but Daniels has been the key to that. Only uh, two interceptions so far. They're coming off a twenty-seven twenty-two win over the Giants. Jaden Daniels was fifteen of twenty-two, two hundred nine yards, two touchdowns. This sets up a second half for the Steelers, where they're going to face a lot of really good quarterbacks. Lamar Jackson twice, Joe Burrow twice, Jalen Hurts, Jaden Daniels, uh, Patrick Mahomes, obviously. It's not going to be an easy final stretch for the Steelers. I'll be curious to see how they fare. Six and two going into the bye could be a little different coming out of it. Again, we'll get to Steelers kind of on and off. It's obviously the NFL trade deadline tomorrow's show. We'll be recapping and talking about what they do or what they don't do, but I did want to hit on the Penguins a little bit because they play tonight um, at the New York Islanders, and things are looking a little bit better for the Penguins since the last time I talked about them. Um, I know the last time I wrote about them, it was just a defensive mess. Um, they weren't doing a lot of things well, and you know I kind of wrote a, a column, if this doesn't turn around in a hurry, there's going to be some ugly stuff happening. Well, it did kind of turn around in a hurry. On Thursday, 2-1 in overtime against the Ducks. Saturday, 3-1 against the Canadians. Uh, before Thursday's game, they hadn't yielded fewer than three goals in any of their first 11 games this season. But but defensively, they've gotten a lot more responsible. They're looking good in front of Alex Nedeljkovic. Um, and some stuff, again, that shows it's within their grasp. It's a lot of puck decisions. It's a lot of having numbers back. It's a lot of playing smarter, being more defensive re defensively responsible. And good job. Good on the Penguins for doing that. Good on Mike Sullivan for having his team play in a more responsible brand of hockey. Now, we'll see as the competition picks up the Islanders and the Hurricanes, two of the opponents this week, along with the Capitals. Um, they're a lot better suited than the Ducks and the Canadians. So we'll see um, where that hits. Another decision looming with the Penguins that's going to be very interesting is Tristan Jari. 
I'm not sure what you do. And maybe I'll get into this in a little bit more um, depth tomorrow or the next day. But basically, this is the last week they can keep him stashed in the minors. Now, things have gone well for Jari in the minors. He's won his three starts. He's allowed just six goals, a 937 save percentage. And his last game Saturday stopped 30 of 31 in a 2-1 win. Everything the Penguins could want to see out of Jari, they've seen. What does that mean? Well, I still have a tough time believing they can do anything with Jari other than play him, honestly. Um, so when he comes back, whenever that deadline hits, they'll probably give him as much time as they can in the American Hockey League to find his game. Probably going to see Joel Bloomquist go down. Um, Alex Ndelkovic is going to stay with the team. And you're going to have to give Tristan Jari another chance. It kind of stinks for Blomquist. Um, has a team best 909 save percentage at this time. And a lot of times in front of him, the team has not played well. But because of roster status, contracts, all this stuff, I mean, he can go down. Uh, Jari's going to come back. They have to pay him. Um, he, he needs to find his game. I don't have any magical answer. I don't think anybody has any magical answer, but it's encouraging to see him getting results and we'll see kind of what, what the future holds for Tristan Jari. The Penguins obviously need him to be better and it's going to help a lot if they're playing more responsible hockey in front of him, which they have been. The penalty kill has been good. The power play wouldn't say it's been great. Um, hasn't been terrible. Hasn't been quite the train wreck that it was last year. Been a little bit better, but um, again, some of it's goaltending, a lot of it's defense and how responsible they play in front of them. Thanks for watching. Thanks for checking this out today and every day. Um, go out and vote, of course. Um, tomorrow we'll be back. We won't be talking politics or anything like that. I don't care who wins the presidential race, but we will be talking about the NFL trade den deadline and what the heck the Steelers do or don't do. Thanks for watching firsthand, everybody. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com. <laughs>